up. Stretch your hands towards him. We're going to bless him. Father God, thank you for sending this mighty man of God to be here with us. Father, we pray that you continue to use him. Lord, as you're, you've been taking him all around the world, Lord, he's just been to Australia and you're just using him in Florida and all over the place. I just pray in Brazil. I pray that you continue to fill him with your Holy Spirit, Lord. Give him more anointing and authority to um, open blind eyes, to open deaf ears, to uh, even raise the dead. Because the world needs to know that you are alive and well and you're moving through your people. Keep using Richie to encourage churches to uh, do the work of ministry. Because we know, God, we are, we are um, here to equip the church. And so I pray that you continue to use your son and bless his wife and, uh, as she holds the fort. Bless the kids. And, Father, continue to provide for him in every way. And use your son for your glory to this morning. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. 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 Will you praise God for he reaches life? Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. How many of you have heard me speak before? Just raise your hand. Awesome. How many of you have not heard me speak before? Raise your hand. All right. Fresh meat. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. 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 I grew up in uh, Newport News, Virginia, where you could throw a rock and hit three churches by accident. There's churches everywhere. It's hard to grow up in Virginia and not know about Christ. How many people know it's a big difference between knowing about Christ and actually knowing Jesus? And so I knew about Jesus, but I didn't know him personally. At 18 years old, I got radically saved. It was a bunch of radically saved black dudes that uh, were on fire for Jesus, and all they didn't want to do is talk about Jesus all day long and say, you know, he said this to me, he said that to me. You know, I'm like, what are you talking about? Jesus said something to you. See, because it never occurred to me that Jesus wanted to speak to me and have a relationship with me. You know, uh, but they were like, yeah, don't you know John 10? My sheep hear my voice, and they follow me, and I know them. That's what Jesus said. And all of a sudden it hit me. You can't know someone that you don't talk to but also listen to. And it's not a matter of do you just believe in Jesus. Even the devil believes in Jesus. That's not enough. It's the question is, are you following Jesus and is he Lord of your life? Jesus said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Come on. So for following Jesus, uh, then we're identifying with his heart for the lost, and we're being obedient to his spirit. He's going to make us reconcilers of men to the Father. I love that story. But this is our ministry. In 2 Corinthians 5, it, the Apostle Paul, by the Holy Spirit, says we've been given the ministry of reconciliation. Just like the spirit was inside of Jesus, not counting their trespasses against them, reconciling people to the Father. Now we've been given this ministry of reconciliation like we're ambassadors, we're, we're begging people, we're pleading with people, be reconciled to God. Say, my ministry is the ministry of reconciliation. Come on. You're there to testify of what you see and what you hear in your relationship with Jesus. Come on. That's just good news. Say, it's fun to follow Jesus. It's fun to follow Jesus. So I got radically saved uh, as a result of seeing people that were on fire for Jesus. Their relationship with Jesus inspired me to pursue Jesus for relationship. And I cried out to him in my pickup truck on the way home from work. God, I don't know you like they know you, but I want to. God, I want to fulfill the plan that you have for my life. Lord, I, I, I want to, but I know I'm not strong enough to do it, God. But you're able to look at my heart, and you're able to impart to me. You're able to give me the grace to be the man that you created me to be. God, I want to help me, save me, deliver me. I prayed a prayer, something like that, and it was as if somebody poured 10,000 gallons of liquid love on me in my pickup truck. Just the presence of God came in, and I was radically born again. And just right away, I was picking up homeless people, bringing them to McDonald's or Hardee's, and, hey, you want a cheeseburger? And I didn't know nothing except for how to buy you a cheeseburger, share John 3.16 in my testimony. That's all I knew, and people were getting saved every day. Come on. So many people are like, well, I don't know what to say. I need to go to another training, another conference, or whatever. The Lord spoke to me. He said, I want people to have more than they want more. Everywhere you go, there are people crying out, God, give me more, give me more. But the question is, are you being faithful with what he's given you already? See, most people aren't even faithful with what he's been given. God's a good investor. Be faithful with what you've been given. Amen? 
Come on. You believe that Jesus heals people today? Do you believe the word of God? Well, the Bible says in Mark 16, these signs follow those who believe. So there's a sign that follows those who believe. One of them is they'll lay their hands on the sick and they'll recover. You know how I know that you believe the word, that word specifically? You lay your hands on the sick and you pray and they recover. <laughs> Maybe not every time, but at least you're laying your hands on the sick and you're praying because you believe. You know how I know you don't believe? You never lay your hands on the sick and you never pray for people to recover. And therefore, nothing happens. Come on. Do you think Jesus only heals people in church? Come on. You know how I know you believe that he heals people outside of church and grocery stores? You lay hands on people outside of the church, in grocery stores, at banks, anywhere you go. Amen? Amen. Say it's fun, it's fun to follow Jesus. So we share a lot of stories about Brazil, and I love Brazil, and I think Brazil is in revival, and I think a lot of people, everybody should go to Brazil with Dr. Randy Clark with Global Awakening. I'm an evangelist with Global Awakening, and uh, I think you should go just simply because of what God's doing there and because you get immersed in the culture for a couple weeks, and it's something about the immersion. It's something about, as well, the sacrifice that it takes. It costs money. It, ta it costs time. And God honors humility. God honors hunger. And a lot of times, God will ask us to step out of our normal, to step into something that's out of our normal, to sacrifice. And in those places of sacrifices, we have divine encounters. So sometimes people are like, if God wants to touch me, he could just touch me here. Yeah, he could. He's sovereign. He could do whatever he wants. But also, he wants to partner with you, and he's looking to partner with humility. Amen. So I'll, I'll tell you, I love Brazil. I love South Africa. I love going around the world and preaching the gospel around the world. But I want to share some stories about Canada because I'm in Canada and because I love Canada. My wife is from Canada, and uh, I lived in Canada in Calgary, Alberta uh, for seven years. Um, three of my four kids were born there, and I've seen a lot of miracles and signs and wonders in Canada. Matter of fact, I'm going to tell you one. Before I became a well-known itinerant evangelist around the world where I was preaching around the world, I had just been saved maybe three years, four years or something like that. Nobody knew who I was. I was a painter before I got saved, and so I painted on the side, and I was a missionary with YWAM at the time. And so I met my wife. We got engaged, got married, and it was in that time period that I was uh, living with my wife in my mother-in-law's house in Calgary, Alberta. It was negative 40 degrees. And I had this thought, why would anyone ever settle here as a human being? <laughs> the air hurts your skin. That's not, we're not supposed to live here. No, I'm just joking. It was so beautiful, actually. Calgary's beautiful. But you learn how to, I, what I learned is the Canadians learn how to play in the cold and not be sissies. You know, they're out there, negative 40 degrees playing hockey. I'm like, these guys are crazy. Anyway, so uh, I complained the whole seven years. I never got used to it. But I, I actually did uh, value and actually love, I love, love, love going into the mountains, Banff and Lake Louise and just a beautiful area. But anyway, it was negative 40 degrees. We we're going to watch a movie. Uh, my wife likes popcorn. Uh, and her mom, they, they have a homemade popcorn machine, and they have like this, you know, s vinegar, salt they put on it, and butter, and it's like really good or whatever. And so they love that when they're watching movies. And I don't mind popcorn. I just don't like how it gets in your teeth. You know, so I don't prefer it. I'd rather have chips and dip. I'm a chips and dip guy. I like chips and salsa. And that day, I just had such a craving for chips and salsa. I'm like, you know, I don't care how cold it is outside. I want to go to get some chips and salsa at the superstore. And you know that's a craving when I would go out in negative 40. And so I'm like, I got this chips and salsa sauce, uh, you know, craving. And so um, I'm going to go to the superstore. My mother-in-law's like, well, I got to get some stuff. I'll go with you. So we, we pull out of the house, and we go into the parking lot. As soon as we get into the parking lot, my right shoulder starts to hurt, and I start to laugh. And my mother-in-law is like, what you laughing at? I said, because my right shoulder started hurting. She said, well, that's not funny. 
I said, no, you don't understand. It's not my pain. God's going to heal somebody in, in the store of right shoulder pain. You see, that's, a, that's what you call a word of knowledge. That means I know something either past or present that I couldn't have known unless the Holy Spirit revealed it to me. So the Holy Spirit will speak to you in multiple ways, but one of the ways that he'll speak to you, especially about healing, is he'll allow you to identify with somebody else's pain that you're supposed to pray for. That both gives you compassion and faith that he's about to do a miracle, and it also draws your attention to them. And so when I started feeling that pain, I was like, I never get pain in my right shoulder until I pulled in this parking lot. God, you must want to heal somebody in the store. He confirmed it in my heart. I said that to my mother-in-law, and you could see just fear went all over her face. <laughs> She's like, why did I come with this guy, you know? <laughs> now, she got excited. She likes to do that kind of stuff. But anyway, I started to just, in that moment, I started to become so aware of God that I'm more aware of me than I am of my uh, more aware of him than I am of my own insecurities and my own shortcomings. And I think that's an important thing to do, that you would understand that you're not the best evangelist. You're not the best prophet. You're not the best miracle worker. You're not the best healer. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm not the best, but my best friend is. See, the Holy Spirit is the greatest healer. He's the greatest evangelist. He's the greatest miracle worker. He's the greatest prophet. And he is with us always. That's why Jesus says, I'm going away, but I'm going to send to you a helper, the Holy Spirit. It's to your advantage that I go away. And so God spoke to me, and he said, tell the church everywhere you go that, there's, that we need to start taking advantage of our advantage, and we'll see Jesus get his full reward. Right? So I'm, it's the moment I realize God wants to use me, I just put my attention on him. I press into him because he's the breakthrough, amen? I just got to be so much more aware of who's inside of me and who's with me than I am of my own humanity in that way. Does that make sense? So I start getting really happy because in his presence is a little bit of joy, right? In his presence is how much joy? Say fullness. You measure fullness with overflow. So that means this bottle isn't fully full of water unless it's spilling over. That means you're not completely full unless you're splashing on the people around you. So part of our role as Christians is to drink and leak everywhere we go. <laughs> drink in that, sh that river of eternal life, right? That Holy Spirit river until you're overflowing with joy, you know? So the more I became aware of the presence of God, the more happy I got. And so I'm like laughing and, you know, that the, the world system is... Uh, a counterfeit like you know in the in the world you guys always just been saved your whole life or has anybody like had a time where you weren't saved you know in the world when you don't drink like when you when you drink like there's certain things that happen to you so like back when I was in the world you know I had 18 felonies before I was 16 years old I was like in and out of juvenile detention I like to party and that kind of thing you know and and we knew this like we had this thing called liquid courage we would, we would call, call it liquid courage. What's that mean? That means like I'm walking into the club, right, and I see a dime piece. Say a 10. A 10. It's a 10. That's how we say it in the South. A 10. You know, you see a 10 over there. That's, that's, a, that's a 10 out of 10. That girl's out of your league. You know you don't have a, a chance with her. She's so beautiful, whatever. But besides, she's got this big hunk of a football player on her hip, you know, and he's got ripped muscle. He looks like a piece of granite, and you can't take him. You know you can't take him. But all of a sudden, you have a few drinks, <laughs> got that liquid courage in you, and all of a sudden, you Brad Pitt. <laughs> you Mike Tyson, right? Like, you're going... No, you, what you're going to happen is you're going to get knocked out. See, because it's the spirit of stupid as well, you know. It's the world system, you know what I'm saying? So, like, but it's that liquid courage, you know. That's, that, it's a counterfeit, though. That's why the Bible says don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the spirit. See, being filled with the spirit is the counterfeit. Like, the, being drunk on wine is the counterfeit to being filled with the spirit. Just like... Like being drunk on alcohol can make a person seem like they're bolder or more courageous. When you get full of the Holy Spirit, it makes you bold. It gives you courage. How about this? Anybody ever seen a, you know, a lot of times it's a girl. Sometimes it could be a guy. Anybody ever seen somebody who gets drunk on wine or alcohol and they got that I love you drunk thing? You know what I'm talking about? I'm trying to figure out if you guys are just all saved your whole life or not. 
You know what I'm talking about? Like, it's, it's kind of like they drink a bit, and then next thing you know, they have a couple glasses, and they're calling people at 2 a.m., and they're like, yeah, I just want to tell you how much I love you. And they're like walking all around, I love you, and I love you, and I love you. And that's the I love you drunk, right? You know what I'm talking about? It's a counterfeit, though. You can get so full of the Holy Spirit that you're just overwhelmed with the love of God. And everybody you see, you see what God sees when he died on the cross and he gave his life for him. He loves them because he loves them because he loves them. Anybody ever experienced so much of the outpouring of God's spirit, you just feel like you're overflowing with love for people? It's like, man, I love dogs. I even love cats. You know, that's supernatural. Like, I just love everything, you know? Like, it's being full of the Holy Spirit. And so I'm, I'm, I'm actually trying to equip you to get your own stories. I, I want you to understand how some of these miracles happen, like practically, like how to receive a word of knowledge, how you experience it, how do I step out of timidness and, like, shyness, because you know it's not about you. People are like, well, I'm shy. I'm an introvert. You're an extrovert. And I'm like, all I'm hearing is I, 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 I. I thought it wasn't about you. I thought you got born again. I thought the life that you live is no longer your life, but it's in Christ. I thought it was Christ who lives in you now. Amen? As many who are led by the Spirit of God are the sons and daughters of God. It's not about you or your personality type or your gifting type or if you're an evangelist or a pastor or any of that. It's about you trusting the Holy Spirit in you. In your weakness, his strength is made perfect. Amen? So if you think you're weak in evangelism, then good, you qualify. You've got to completely depend on the Holy Spirit, and he's the greatest evangelist anyway. So how practically do we do that? I'm teaching you. This is how I do it. I had a heart, a pain in my shoulder. My initial response was, okay, God, you want to heal somebody? I actually don't know if I can do that. I can't do healing, but you can do healing. <laughs> so I'm just going to rejoice right now, intentionally. I'm going to start laughing intentionally. <laughs> you're saying you're being fake. No, I'm not. I'm being spiritually obedient. Because the Bible says rejoice sometimes when you feel like it, right? No, rejoice always, and again, I say rejoice. The Bible says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, kindness, patience, gentleness, self-control. So I'm activating the fruit of the Spirit, which is self-control, to be joyful, which means I'm being biblically obedient to rejoice always. And as I rejoice always, something's happening. I'm bringing my body, my mind into alignment with the spiritual reality that God is getting ready to heal somebody in their shoulder in advance, and I am rejoicing in the fact that I get to see it and be a part of it. <laughs> you can use somebody so weak like me. <laughs> and so I start laughing, and here's the funny thing. You'll start laughing on purpose at first, and it might not be voluntary, but after a while, if you'll laugh for 15 to 20 seconds, it becomes involuntary. And then you're like looking at each other like, why are we laughing? I don't know. <laughs> you know, and it, what's happening is actually serotonin and dopamine is being released in your brain. It's actually scientifically proven that whether you l laugh intentionally or unintentionally, the same dopamine and serotonin is released into your body. Isn't that interesting how God can tell us to do something that is good for us, rejoice always, and it's actually literally scientifically good for you? Come on. I don't know if you guys realize how good a news that is. You don't have to just do it when you're going to do, like, like, evangelism. You can just do that all the time. I tell people all the time, man, you should take your medicine every day. Like, what do you mean? The Bible says in Proverbs, a merry heart is like medicine. So just laugh for 30 seconds in the morning when you get up and brush your teeth. Just laugh on purpose. Look at yourself in the mirror start laughing. <laughs> Just start rejoicing. Yes, God, I'm with you. And you're like, that seems crazy. I know, but it's in faith, you know. You'll find, you do that three times a day, you're going to feel a shift happening. You're going to start walking in more joy. Your countenance should manifest the fact that you believe the gospel. And so I'm laughing, right? And so I walk into the store, and by the time I get into the store, I'm like, I love you drunk, but in the spirit. I see everybody I see as a target for the love of God. I'm not waiting for somebody to be highlighted. I'm like, hey, Jesus loves you. Have a good day. And they're all like, okay. You know, like, and I don't care. You know why I don't care? Because I'm so aware of his love for me. They can't reject me because I've already been accepted. 
I'm more aware of his acceptance of me than I am of people's rejection. So I'm like, Jesus loves you. And some people are like, yeah, thank you. And other people go, all right. You know, and I'm like, Jesus loves you. You have a great smile. God bless you. And one person in the whole store is highlighted in the midst of the hundreds of people that are there. What do I mean by highlighted? They're standing out to me in the midst of a crowd. It's one of the ways that God will speak to you. And I notice them, two different areas, three different areas. But I get to where the peppers are, you know, where they got all the produce. And I see this guy over by the peppers, and he's doing this with his shoulder. And I'm like, look, there he is. <laughs> My mother-in-law is walking with me beside me the whole time. As soon as I say, look, there he is, she kind of slows her walk down, you know. <laughs> and I walk up to this guy at the peppers, and I'm like, excuse me, sir, this might sound weird or crazy, you know, or out in left field, but I'm a Christian. And when I pulled into the parking lot, I felt like God told me he wanted to heal somebody in their right shoulder. Do you have pain in your right shoulder? And he's like, yeah, I do, son. I, I, I got in an, uh, an accident when I was in the military. I had to get surgery in my shoulder. And whenever it gets cold outside like it is today, it really hurts me. And I'm in a lot of pain. And I said, I believe God wants to heal you. Can I pray for you? He's like, yeah, thank you very much. And he turns around and he starts shopping. He thinks I'm going to pray on my own time, you know. <laughs> and I'm like, no, you don't understand. I want to pray for you right now. I won't even be weird. I won't close my eyes or pray long or anything. It'll be short, brief, and powerful. And he, you, you understand, sometimes Christians pray as though they have more mercy than God. It's like they're begging God to do something that he doesn't want to do. And they pray these long prayers. I think they're trying to pray themselves into faith or something, you know. But how many people know that the predominant prayers biblically when it comes to healing were short commanding prayers? So we're speaking to the body. We're speaking in authority. That's the primary biblical model for healing. It's not just petitionary. Although we can petition for healing, it's just not the primary way that we see healing take place. You understand that? And so I'm like, I'll just pray short, brief, and powerful. I won't even have to close my eyes. He's like, all right, I guess. And so I'm like, in the name of Jesus, shoulder be healed. Amen. And he's like, all right, thank you. And he turns around. He's going to keep shopping. See, see. sometimes Christians are just power, like they're just proud of themselves, pat themselves on the back for just stepping out and taking a risk, which is awesome. I love that. But this next step is super important to the healing ministry. Say this with me. No, check it out. Say, check it out. So I said, no, you don't understand. I believe God healed you right now. Go ahead and check it out. See if you could do something you couldn't do before. So many times, there are times that people feel heat or tingling, but a lot of times people feel nothing, and they don't even realize they're healed until they start to try to do something they couldn't do before. So the guy's like, check it out. And I'm like, yeah, try to do something you couldn't do before. And he goes like this. <laughs> and now he's being weird. He's drawing the attention. And I'm like, yeah, Jesus healed this guy. And I'm drawing. I'm like, yeah, Jesus saves. And I share the gospel. And it's powerful, you know. And um, I walk around the corner. And now I'm super happy. And I see the guy. Remember the guy I said that was highlighted to me? Here he is walking at me. I didn't even have time to think about what I was going to say. And here's another supernatural key. Oftentimes, you got to put yourself in a position to where if God doesn't show up, it ain't going to turn out very good. Oftentimes, God won't share with you all the information in advance. He'll wait till you step out. And when you step out, he'll begin to speak to you. Come on. Say faith. Faith spells risk. And so I saw the guy. I know God's speaking to me about him. I just don't know what yet, so I'm going to step into it. So I just walk up to the guy, and I'm like, now, you got to understand, I'm kind of like liquid heaven drunk. Now, I'm so overwhelmed with God's spirit and his goodness in me. I'm like, everybody's a target, right, kind of thing. And I walk up to him, hey, guy, man, I just wanted you to know Jesus is highlighting you to me. I don't even know what I'm going to say next, you know. And I, he likes, okay. And I'm like, matter of fact, he says you're a creative genius. He says you play multiple instruments uh, and you have a unique voice. Your friends will call you to sing on their uh, there are lyrics and stuff like that because you have such a unique voice. You'll create lyrics for other people's melodies. You'll create melodies for other people's lyrics. You're like a real creative genius, man. Matter of fact, I don't even know if you're a Christian or not, but I felt like Jesus said, if you'll worship me in the secret place, I'll give you songs that will change the world. And I said, does that make sense to you at all? And he looks at me kind of like, seemed like forever, like, 
it was probably just 30 seconds or something, but he looks at me like just pondering what I'm saying, and he pulls out his wallet, he pulls out his, his business card, and he says, this is so strange. Everything you just said is what I do for a living. He says, I sing over other people's melodies. I create melodies for other people's songs. I actually have a company that we create doodles for commercials, and we create different things. And he says, I play the bass guitar in a local rock band. I, say, I play multiple instruments. And he says, but this is the craziest part about it. My, my, my wife is a big Christian. And she's so crazy about Jesus, and it's been driving me crazy lately. I'm not a believer, but it, I said before I came into this store today, Jesus, if you're real, prove yourself to me. And then you walk up to me and tell me all about my life. Like, <laughs> so I exchanged emails with him. His name is Jeremy. He writes me back the next day. And then he says, Richie, I just want to let you know and thank God for you. I now know what I always hoped to be true but didn't know for sure, that Jesus is in fact real and he's always around us. He writes me six months later. He says, Richie, I just want to let you know I'm still doing good with Jesus. And I just wrote and directed all the music for the Calgary Theater in downtown Calgary for the show Much Ado About Nothing. Wrote to me six months later, and he says, Richie, I just want to let you know I'm still doing good with Jesus, and I just wrote and directed the music for another play in the downtown Calgary Theater. So here's somebody who's influencing my city through the mountain of entertainment. You understand, if we're going to disciple the nations, there's different mind molders in society, and one of them is entertainment. Somebody said, show me your musicians, show me your, your artists, and I'll show you those who are impacting culture. How many people know like Taylor Swift is having a major impact on culture right now on the young people growing up? Like it or hate it, that's, it's happening, right? So if you can win a Taylor Swift, if you can win a, uh, some of these influencers to the Lord and they begin to produce music that then will impact the way that people think, amen? So here I am and I just get a craving for chips and salsa and the Lord has me impacting somebody who's going to impact my city through the creative mountain. Amen? Say, it's fun to follow Jesus. Every day becomes an adventure, even just trips to chips and salsa at Superstore. Amen? Come on. Jesus wants to use you in power. He wants to release his anointing on you to win souls. I felt like God wanted me to share with you some of these stories that happened in Canada. I shared a different story in the first service. I don't know if they have it recorded, but you can listen to that story. That also happened in Canada, the story I shared in the first service. This story happened in Canada. I've seen countless people healed in Canada, blind eyes, deaf ears open. I've seen people um, that were par par paralyzed on different extremities uh, receive their healing. One time I was doing a healing meeting with my friend Ahab. We were in the Dream Center where he had planted our church. And um, Ahab was sharing a story about somebody who had metal in their legs that was healed. And, and what we didn't know is there was a guy who's working on their, his testimony. He's an addict. At the Dream Center, they're getting set free of addictions. And this guy had walked in, and he sat right beside me on the front row. He doesn't know protocol. He, just, he never goes to church. He smells like cigarettes completely, like he just smoked a half pack of cigarettes right before he sat beside me. And he's listening to Ahab testify, and he says, that's a bunch of BS from the front row. And Ahab looks at him and says, hey, I'm glad you're here. And you're sitting beside Richie Seltzer. He's going to put his hand on your knee, and you're going to see it's not BS. And I said, hey, man, I'm going to put my hand right here. Watch this. And I just put my hand there, and I just began to pray under my breath in the spirit. He said, what are you doing to me? My leg is on fire. It's heating up. I said, that's the Holy Spirit. Just chill out. Watch what happens. He's like freaking out, and I'm like, go ahead and just move your ankle. He said, I can't move my ankle. I've got too many screws and stuff. I said, just move it around. Watch what happens. And he starts moving it around. He said, holy, and starts beep, 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 <laughs> stands up on his feet, and he's totally healed, comes up on the front, gives his life to Jesus, and then he testifies, I was going to commit suicide and go in front of a train, only it just ran his leg over. His leg was completely shattered. He had metal up and down his leg, and God healed his leg. All the metal dissolved out of his leg, and he got full mobility, gave his life to Jesus. That happened in Canada. <laughs> Say he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Come on. Go ahead and stand to your feet if you're able. 
I'm going to go ahead and just begin to pray and close this service. Is that good? Yeah. You guys encouraged? You guys feel edified? Jesus wants to give you more. You want more. Jesus wants to give you more. Listen, I want you to understand something. It's one thing to believe in Jesus. It's another thing to follow Jesus. If you're bored as a Christian, you need help. And here's what I know. I, everywhere I go around the world, I go into different churches. And God spoke to me. And he said, if I can go around any church and only 10 believers were to be doers of the word and not just hearers of the word, then more church would see revival. Who wants to see revival in your church? Who wants to be a part of it? See, God wants us to have revival more than you want to have revival. If I could just get 10 people in this room to be a doer of the word and not just a hearer of the word, your church would be in revival in one year. In Canada, in Spain, in Italy, in the U.S., in Russia, in China, I don't care where you are. If just 10 people were on fire and would do the, what Jesus has commanded us to do, go into all the world and preach the gospel, and those who hear it will believe in their heart will be saved because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, but how can they hear unless somebody preaches? Romans says that I shall not be ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Say the gospel. the gospel. You must preach the gospel. If I could just get 10 people to share the gospel with one person per day for 10 days, 300 people would hear the gospel every 30 days. If only 10% got saved, we'd see 30 people saved every 30 days. If only 5% of those people became disciples and started coming to this church, this church would grow by 15 brand new believers every 30 days. By the end of the year, there'd be 180 brand new believers by the end of one year. And that's if only 10 people would share the gospel with one person per day for 30 days, and they would do it every, every month. The only reason our church don't have revival is because Christians don't preach the gospel. I believe that God wants to touch you right now. I believe that he wants to pour out his Holy Spirit on you right now. But he's not a lip reader. He's a heart reader. You can have all the desire that you want, but God, by his spirit, is who empowers us to be evangelists. It's, it's by his spirit, he empowers us to preach the gospel. Not with wisdom of words that people's faith would be in our wisdom or our ability to explain the Christianity. It's in the power of God, that their faith would be in the power of God. That their faith would be in the testimony as you testify to what you see and what you hear without fear. You're a witness. See, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you in Acts chapter 1, Jesus said, you shall receive power when he comes upon you, and you shall be witness of me, both in Jerusalem and around the world. This is why the Holy Spirit comes upon them in Acts chapter 2, and the fire of God touches them in their heart, because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, and they receive tongues of fire. And what are they testifying? They're testifying of the glories of God, and 3,000 people get saved. Because this is what happens when the Holy Spirit comes upon people, is he empowers them to be bold as lions. It's the spirit of holiness, the spirit of burning, the spirit of fire. And the proverb says the righteous are as bold as a lion. Boldness is not a personality type. Boldness is a yes in your heart. Boldness is saying, I'm no longer going to say no to the Holy Spirit. I'm going to follow the Holy Spirit, and I'm going to do whatever he tells me to do when he tells me to do it. And in doing that, you're saying in John 14, I love you, God. Because Jesus said, if you love me, then you'll obey my commandments. You can't say that we love God if we don't obey God. See, you can hear the Holy Spirit. You can hear his voice. The question is, will you be obedient when he tells you to do different things? And the only way that we can do that is if we can receive his love. See, because 1 John says we love him because he first loved us. A lack of evangelism in our life is just the fruit of a receiving problem. See, the degree that you can receive his love is to the degree that you'll be obedient to his voice. And when you're obedient to his voice, you're going to see the supernatural power of God in display through your life. This morning... Even as we're playing right now, I want you to understand something. Jesus is calling you yes. to a deeper surrender. Not just to know about him, 
but to go all in. He doesn't want to just be your side chick. He wants to be your main thing. He wants to be your everything. He's got a great adventure for you to go on. And there are many souls that are at stake. People's lives are at stake. And there are many people who are living apathetic in their everyday life. But God is saying, come to me. Come to me. Go all in. Put your life on the altar. Fire always falls on acceptable sacrifice. It doesn't fall on every sacrifice. It only falls on acceptable sacrifice. But the only acceptable sacrifice is your whole life laid down in love. He says, give me your whole life. Give me all of your pride. Give me all of your dreams. Give me everything. And let my fire fill you. If that's you this morning and you know you need to go all in. You want to go all in. Maybe you've given your life to the Lord in the past, or maybe you haven't. But this morning, you want to go all in. You want to, you want to say, yes, I'm, I'm giving my whole life. I'm putting my life on the altar. I want the fire of God to fall upon this acceptable sacrifice, which is my life. Lord, pour out your fire on me, God. I want to see people reconciled through my life. I want to see people healed through my life, God. I want, I want your life to to be on display through my life, that you would receive glory through my life fully, God. Here am I. I present myself to you. If that's you, I want you to put your hand up quickly, 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 quickly. Lord, let's pray together. Jesus, you're looking at my heart. I want you to fill me with your Holy Spirit right now. I surrender my whole life, my mind, my will, my emotions, my money, everything. I surrender it. I lay it on the altar. God, I want to follow you. I want to be a disciple. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. I renounce every other spirit. Get out. Fill me with your power to be a witness. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen.